born scientists for the most part. There are a couple exceptions. Jack Schmidt uh, was a PhD geologist, uh, one of the last people to walk on the moon. And Charlie Walker uh, was an engineer for McDonnell Douglas back in the 80s. He invented a continuous uh, flow electrophoresis uh, system, and he actually flew it in the shuttle three times. His, you know, that, he was basically flew as a payload specialist flying his experiment, but that was unusual for the most part. Uh, most there were payload specialists on the on the shuttle, but they were being they were doing other people's experiments. So, so in space, people aren't used to putting the butts on the back. But that's going to change, as, as I said, because Virgin Galactic, X4, Armadillo, Blue Origin, they're going to be actually flying people into space. They're not just going to be people taking toy rides. They're going to be people doing research. In fact, that may be a bigger market than we saw at the, at the conference last week. Then. Than the people who won't do it just for the experience. Next part. Uh, in general, discovery exploration has been very risky. Uh, when Magellan went around the world, he took he started with five ships because he knew he was going to lose some. And it's a long story. In fact, it's a fascinating book. There's a book that was written about it a few years ago. Uh, but they, uh, you know, two of them basically mutinied. Brazil and they headed back to Spain, so then they were only stuck in three before they even got out of the Atlantic. And then they got through, got around the Horn, headed across the Pacific, made it to the Philippines, where Magellan was killed uh, by, the, by the natives. Interesting fact, the first person to actually circumnavigate the world was Magellan's navigator. <laughs> because he was from the Philippines. So, so when he got there, he got home, he'd been all the way around. The other guys, Anyway, uh, another ship uh, was damaged so badly that they had to leave it. The third one decided to try to head back the way they came, and it was captured by the Spanish, I think. And, uh, and only one ship made it all the way around the Horn of Africa and back to Spain, and only, I think, about five or six of the original crew were on it. So it was, there was a lot of attrition in that mission. If they'd start up fewer than five, they'd probably be in need. Franklin Expedition. They all died. Probably they died mostly because they went nuts because they had got lead poisoning from from bad uh, camp. And this is like in the 1840s when it was a very new cutting edge technology. And that worked the bug out, the bugs out. But there's a possibly apocryphal ad that Ernest Shackleton read. I don't know if you can read it, but it says this is in the London Times about 100 years ago when he was doing the Antarctic exploration. It said men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness. Constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. And he got plenty of volunteers. <laughs> we don't seem to have that attitude when it comes to space. The next chart. Um, not just exploration, but emigration. You know, pioneering. Very dangerous. Uh, the Irish was particularly brutal. You know, they were at 30% loss rate on some of those ships when they're they escaping from Ireland in the 1840s, coming to Canada, coming to the U.S. Uh, some of the ships themselves went down. You know, their roadways are all, all kinds of hit, hit, you know, they didn't have weather warnings, all the stuff we have now. Uh, all kinds of sickness and diseases. The same thing opening up the West. You know, a lot of people died of cholera. Uh, very easy to kill yourself just doing normal stuff because you hurt yourself. Chopping wood and other things, and plus uh, the Indian Wars. So, I guess the message is on the next chart. Uh, this is the harshest frontier that we are ever going to open. You know, there's lots of ways to kill you almost instantly out in space. And it's going to take a lot of technology to be able to do it. Of course, that was true with every frontier. If you took somebody off the savannah in Africa, you plop them down in the Arctic in the winter, he wouldn't last much longer than he last took him on the moon. You know, he'd die of exposure very quickly. But, but, we, but yet we, we obsess about safety and opening up this frontier that's the toughest one. You know, we shut down the shuttle each year, each, each, for almost three years each time we lost one, we shut it down. Uh, we spent billions to make sure that no one dies. And we wasted it because we killed people anyway. Right? Uh, 
just this week, just last week, I guess Senator Nelson said that the FAA shouldn't shouldn't be involved with NASA space flight, despite the fact that it's got a lot better safety record than NASA does. Uh, and just this week, a bunch of officer public demanded that NASA take charge of SpaceX's safety procedures. <laughs> It's kind of like putting Jack the Lorcan in charge of a cancer clinic. <laughs> but but it's, it's really crazy to be this risk averse, to be so obsessed with safety, to say safety is number one. If safety is number one, you're not going to get much done. You know, John Shedd uh, wrote, I don't know when, 100 years ago, a ship in a harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. And so the, the reason we're, we are this way is that because NASA was not formed, the space, purpose of the space program is not to open up the high frontier. Space settlement is not on the national agenda, it never was. Apollo was not about space, it just happened to be that we decided to, to you know, dump our technological chests over space. You know, if we'd been racing to the bottom of the Marianas Trench instead, we would have done that. But we got there in 1960, so that was already done. So they just tried to pick something. What can we do to show that we're superior to the Russians, to the Soviets? And so they decided, in fact, Kennedy asked Mount Brown, should we build a space station or should we go to the moon? He said, well, I think they might beat us to building a space station, but I think we can get to the moon first. So that's what it was all about. It had nothing to do with the moon, per se. And it, it, it uh, barely, we barely got to the moon as it was. It's, it's amazing that we could sustain it that long, and it happened just because of a, a unique set of circumstances that I'll describe in the next chart. By the way, uh, just that last bullet. There's not, if you read the Space Act, the, the, the le enabling legislation for NASA does not talk about human space flight. It's not in there. But yet everybody thinks that's what NASA is all about. It's only because of this history. Uh, because Henry beat Nixon, you know, the big, big issue was the missile gap, and then he had a foreign policy disaster, so we wanted to try to distract from that, and then he had to respond to Gagarin's first flight in May. Uh, as I said, uh, Von Braun said we could beat him to the moon, so they beat the moon in, in late May of 1961, almost 51 um, years ago. Next chart. And so what we ended up with was this crash project where the model was waste anything but time. So they developed an entire culture of spending money. You know, it didn't matter what it cost. And they've never been able to get away from that. They're still stuck with it. And, and in that case, safety was important because it was the goal. Because Kennedy said, we're going to send a man to the moon and turn, return him safely to the Earth. So, so they had to do that, so safety became a high priority. Next chart. And we really barely just managed to do it. If Kennedy hadn't been assassinated, there's a good chance he would have canceled our studies because it was getting expensive. In fact, just before, just before he died that summer, he was actually talking to the Soviets about doing a joint mission and ending the race. Because it was getting very expensive. But once he was uh, assassinated, then that kind of gave us some momentum. Now we had to do it, you know, to preserve Camelot and, and the gold and the dream and all this stuff. Next chart. So as I said, it, going from the NACA, which was the, the organization that was doing a lot of technology development for the aviation industry, and doing a pretty good job of, uh, through most of the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, they all got folded into NASA, and all of a sudden, because of Apollo, it became you know, dramatically oriented to this thing that some people in the space had great cause. Uh, so instead of being just a technology development agency, which was doing pretty well, it turned into an actual operational transportation agency. And we thus developed a mindset which persists even to this day. You know, a couple of years ago, when the new policy was announced that now NASA is not going to be sending people, you know, to look sending its own crew into space, and we're going to have commercial companies do that. And there was just this, people were shocked because they couldn't imagine NASA not building and developing and operating its own rockets. This is just like, because they, they've never known anything else. It's, 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 it's what I call the Apollo cargo You know, it's why they were, what they insist on building a big rocket, because that's how we got to the moon, that's how we got to get back to the moon. There's no other way to do it.
So a lot of times people talk about NASA and American exceptionalism. And you can say, well, yes, certainly being the first and maybe only nation to land on the moon is a pretty exceptional thing. That's right in line with American exceptionalism, right? You know, and, and we didn't claim it. We didn't claim it. We were the first ones there, but we said we came for all mankind. We planted our flag. But let's think about that. What is American exceptionalism next year? Actually, in some sense, it's actually an exception to American exceptionalism. So what American exceptionalism is supposed to be all about are the kind of things that the Trump will recognize. It's about individualism, it's about liberty, it's about free minds and markets, competition. But NASA during Apollo, as uh, Will said, it was it's not just a monopoly, but a monopsony. He said a monop monolithic bureaucracy, five to ten year plans, worship of national heroes and these. What does that look like? It doesn't look like America. You know, that's, that almost looks like fashion. And it's because it was a response, we were in a war. It was our response to the Soviet state socialist program. We set up one of our own. But it wasn't, wasn't something by which you don't appear. It's not something by which you generate wealth. It's, it was a national prestige. So the question is, half a century later, that Cold War is over. What do we want to do with space now? What, is, what should we be doing? Should we continue with that old model that seems to have failed in terms of putting people into space in large numbers? Try something else. Yeah, our state socialist program can meet your state socialist program. Yes, and the only difference was ours was was a democratic one, and theirs was, was completely totalitarian. But really, that was the only difference. You know, they had design bureaus, we had big aerospace companies, but it worked pretty much the same way. So these are there's a few myths of the whole space age that I'm going to run through here, because uh, people people believe them because of this history. I won't, I'll just go through them one by one so you can spot them. This is just kind of ones I'm going to touch on. Next. Okay. Apollo was about space. I've talked about this already. It really wasn't about space. It just happened to take place in space. It was, you know, gladiatorial, gladiatorial combat. It was about technological superiority. And because, you know, we were worried about it from a space standpoint because it said if, if you could do some stuff to the moon, it means that you got good missile technology. And missile technology was really important in the 60s. Uh, but it was very clear in 1967 when we signed the Outer Space Treaty that we weren't interested in opening up space because, because basically that treaty said uh, you can't have national sovereignty. In other words, that's when we landed on the moon. That's why we didn't claim it because it would have been a violation of the Outer Space Treaty. And the reason that the State Department wanted to sign that treaty was because they wanted to end the space race. It was very expensive. In fact, they wanted to get to grab some of the NASA budget for themselves. Okay. Okay. Human space life is not about science. Everybody talks about space science. That, that's not why we send humans into space. But not to say that they don't do useful science when they go, though there hasn't been a lot of it since Apollo. But you know, Apollo did a lot of good science. They, did, they got a lot more science on the moon. Uh, from the astronauts than we did any other way. It's just very expensive, very not very cost effective. But really when you look at the field, nobody's won a Nobel Prize for anything having to do with human space flight. There aren't that many cited papers. Uh, most of what happens on orbit is really engineering, it's not science. And you can't justify science. But you can't justify human space flight on the basis of science. Otherwise, when you do that, then it makes you ask, so why is it that NASA is getting, NASA and Space Flight is getting about the same amount of money as the entire National Science Foundation. It doesn't make any sense. It's so out of balance. Next chart. Okay. Human Space Flight really has very little to do with National Science. And Senator Hutchinson keeps talking about how it's critical to national security to build that giant rocket that we don't need. But she never explains why. It's just sort of taken as a given. Air Force has never found a need for man in space. Uh, all the military satellites now are launching commercial rockets that have nothing to do with NASA. Uh, they were launching, they were military satellites launched on the shuttle in the early days. Eventually, they quit doing that. And that, the whole point of NASA was to say that we, unlike the Soviets, our, we have a peaceful, civil human space flight. It's deliberately not military. That's why we set up as a special separate agency and just have instead of having military, just because the Soviets. So 
in the current environment with the Cold War over, it's really hard to say that, that there's much to do with national security. Uh, only governments can do space like safety. Well, if that's true, then nobody can. Because NASA certainly doesn't. But if you look at the actual reliability, uh, Atlas hasn't had a failure in I don't know how many months, but it's been years. They got a failure in there. there and, and the military uses them for billion dollar defense satellites. So the notion that it's unsafe to put a human on top of that is, is really, frankly, nuts. So far, the, there's not much of a record there to extrapolate from, but so far, Falcon 9 has, has been successful. Uh, it's long, put two payloads into orbit with no uh, Hopefully, it'll continue that in uh, April when the US will finally fly. And, and this, this notion that private companies are going to cut corners for safety is nonsense. That's a slander, yeah, Because it's, it's not good business to kill your customers. And in X-Corps case, they'll kill their employees before they kill their customers, so that'll yeah. solve the problem right there. I, I was the first guy in the right seat of our second rocket plane. Yeah. So uh, somebody, somebody is going to be, whether it's Jeff, Jeff Bezos, or George Whiteside, somebody, somebody's probably going to be the first person to kill a customer, but none of them are. They're going to work really, really hard to make sure. Can you get that right, the issue around these we have here? How about that? Yeah. That's a good right on. Yeah, yeah. almost happy. Sure. How many successes has SpaceX had? I haven't had a space uh, No, they've had, they've, they've put payloads into orbit twice successfully, but no failure. Well, the Falcon 9. But Falcon 9. Yeah, Falcon, Falcon 1, the first, first, Two flights, I think, were, were failing. Well, first, they got progressively better. I mean, the, the nice thing about the failure, it was like, I think there were three for five uh, for Falcon 1, but they got better each time. The first one barely got off the bat. And then the second one, you know, got a lot higher. The third one almost got to orbit, but they, they had a tail off problem. They had rear ended it. But, but by the fifth one, you know, they worked out all the bugs, and that's what test programs are for. So if they had gone the other way, if they had a, a success and then they started having failures, that would be worrisome. But it was a perfectly natural thing. It's, it's, your, it's like a trainer rock, a training rock for the company. Uh, anyway, next slide. Uh, human space flight is intrinsically expensive. And, and we do this by extrapolating, you know, fallacy of AC generalization, we extrapolate from, from uh, Apollo when, when nobody cared what it cost, because it was important to get to the moon. And then we have shuttles. And there are lots of reasons why shuttles was over expensive. We, there are lots of false houses to be learned from the shuttle. Uh, but you know, it, was, it was oversized with Air Force requirements. It turned out never not to be really needed. Uh, it wasn't fully reusable. It had a very low flight rate. And the key to, to getting costs down was flight rate. Uh, SpaceX has demonstrated the cost would come down quite a bit. Uh, and when we Either whether it's Elon or somebody else, we get fully reusable systems and we're flying them a lot. But it's going to get a lot cheaper. Next slide. Uh, we've talked about this. NASA has to design and operate a human space like one people. So that's nonsense. If we don't have a national airline, why do we have to have a national space flight? DOD is happy to use commercial aircraft for getting troops to the theater. Why can't NASA use commercial to get their astronauts into orbit? Next slide. Uh, running out of time. Uh, existing shuttle infrastructure. There's the argument. Oh, well, it's existing, so it's, it's, it's the cheapest way to go is to use the existing infrastructure. No. You've got to get rid of, you've got to do things completely differently. You're going you're to use legacy hardware, you're going to get legacy costs. You're not going to get the cost down. And that's why the, the Senate launch, the, excuse me, the space launch system is going to cost so much. Because if they insist on using shuttle hardware, this is one to, you know, to sell ATK. We've got to have solid motor infrastructure for national security. Well, again, that's nonsense. The Air Force does not need leverage segmental boosters. It's never, it's never used them. It has no plans to use them. There are plenty of other salads being manufactured. That is not, that's just a justification. Continue to feed money to ATK. So, here are the three rules of space policy. If you understand the rules, um, space policy will make sense. If you don't, don't understand the rules, 
you scratch your head until it's bloody and infected, you're still going to figure it out. It won't make any sense. Uh, so this is rule number one. Space is not important. Okay, next slide. Most people don't. I'll give you rule number two. <laughs> this is rule number two. You want to, want to guess what rule number three is? <laughs> it's like it's like location real estate. Okay. Space is not important. Nothing bad happens in, in a human space like program. If the program doesn't hit its targets. Nobody loses elections, nobody gets fired. And when something's unimportant, that means it's gonna be very subject to politics and pork. And also, that's what causes this inordinate focus on safety over cost of progress. Because if, if it's not important, why are we risking lives on Why are we killing people doing it? That's why people are so upset with Columbia, because they killed seven people doing kids' science fair experiments. What was the point? So, should it be? Yes. Uh, and there's a number of reasons why. You know, what was, why did we settle in the world? Why did we migrate from Africa? There are benefits. We, we need to manage these environmental hazards. Uh, we don't want to be like the dinosaurs. We don't want to have all our eggs in one basket. Uh, there are new resources out there for economic growth both on and, more importantly, even off the planet. And last but certainly not least, uh, we had a, an experiment in Liberty here a couple hundred years ago. I don't know how well it's holding up right now, but uh, hopefully we'll get back to it. But space will offer an opportunity and new laboratories for that kind of thing. Uh, now I'm running out of time, so I'll skip this. I already talked about planetary defense. You got five minutes. Oh, okay. I, I thought it was 25 seconds. That's good. Uh, but I'm almost done. But basically, space is just a place. You know, it's not a program. It's not. It's not a crystal preserve for scientists. It's a new environment you know, for human development and settlement and economic growth. And the thing is that we, we tended to expand. History shows we expand any place into any environment where, where the technology allows us and there are resources and things to gain. Uh, as I said, you can take to pull somebody off the savannah you know, 20,000 years ago put him in, in the Arctic and he'd be in just about a bad shape if you put him in space. You took, took technology, took, you need fire, you need clothing, uh, you, need, you need weapons to kill whales, seals. But if you develop the technology, then you open up a whole new environment and, and the Inuit did that. There are technologies on the horizon, you know, we'll talk about them a little bit. It's, there's a much longer list of this, but these are kind of key. Uh, we've got to have fully reusable vehicles to make it. Affordable. We can't keep throwing the hardware away. And a key to fully reusable vehicles in space uh, is propellant, having propellant caches in various locations. Because uh, right now, you know, NASA's plan for their lunar land, you know, under Constellation Altair, was expendable because because it turns out that the propellant you need to bring a thing back costs more than the hardware. Because we don't have propellant in place to use it. So if we start developing propellant on the moon, then we can start reusing uh, a, a lunar net. And, and, and through that 3D printing in there, because that's just been happening something recently. Uh, a lot of people now are starting to think that's going to be, you're going to be able to start manufacturing a lot of stuff off the planet fairly easily for things like uh, lunar regolith or asteroidal materials. By this, as the 3D printers are made, you be able to build pretty much anything you want as long as you have a computer specification. So that's going to, there's, there's, I just saw a thing uh, recently where somebody's actually showing how, they're talking about how to, how to actually build a structure on the moon you know, that you can live in. So what would a, a serious space policy look like if, if space was important? The, the focus would be on opening the frontier, and that would include homesteading, which also means uh, we have to have property rights. And there are ways to do that. In fact, I'll be issuing a paper probably in the next few weeks uh, about how to do that without violating the outer space law. There are ways to make private property claims without having to have claims of national sovereignty, unfortunately. But we have to accept risk, and we have to let people make their own assessments. And not everybody's people are going to have different opinions about what they're willing to do. Hoorah! We should uh, not have one size fits all, as this Congress seems to think we should. Uh, 
you know, Magellan sounded flotilla. And we need to start thinking about that too. It turns out actually if you, you can take the NASA approach is you, you spend billions on a probe, and so you have to make, put a lot of money to make sure that it's really, really reliable. You know, so you've got all these lines of reliability out, it costs a lot of money. But maybe if you design it for only 90%, you might be able to do it so much cheaper that you could build half a dozen of them. And when you got half a dozen of them, assuming there's no common cause, if you got a 90% thing, you still now you've got you know five nines of mission success. You know at least one of them will work. Uh, and we we need to maintain the moratorium uh, that the FAA is currently operating under in terms of passenger safety. As far as I'm concerned, indefinitely. But certainly we want to move it out. Right now uh, we have about three years three years more of kind of being able to do things on our own without having the FAA come down to our knowledge with, with our semi-arbitrary rules. And, and hopefully we can extend that. Um, but, but basically, we have to somehow tell our congressman that we, we think space is important and we need to start acting. All right. Well, thank you, Rand. Uh, uh, there was an empty slot in the schedule um, before Zach's talk, and so an interest in keeping this room actually active, I'm going to go ahead and give the talk that I meant to give last year. I just downloaded the, uh, the Google Doc, um, and I, it said last edited 365 days ago. So I exactly made this one year ago, and a lot has changed in my life in that year. Uh, so I'm going to hand over the period of time.